All right, so here's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about things that you need to think about after you have a defensive use of force. Statistically, that's not shooting a gun. Statistically, that's threatening to use force. Or statistically, the biggest hit of all is brandishing. And we'll go through what brandishing is in California, but brandishing is basically using or displaying your firearm in a rude, angry, or threatening manner. That could be as little as lifting your shirt and showing the butt of your gun. Depending upon what you're saying and how you're conveying yourself, that could be a felony in California. Or you could draw and be pointing at the ground. That could be a misdemeanor or a felony in California, depending upon how you're conveying yourself. I'll talk about that later. Or you can turn and point because you think there's an imminent threat of great bodily injury or death. Well, that transitions from brandishing into assault with a deadly weapon. As soon as your muzzle covers somebody. Somebody asked yesterday, what if I point off to the side? I said, well, that'll be up for the jury to decide, but you're getting charged with assault with a deadly weapon. As soon as you muzzle cover somebody, you're into assault with a deadly weapon. If you discharge your weapon, now we're into different things. And what I call that is different price levels. So depending upon where you're at, you're at a different price level. So let's talk about the generic. And then we're going to end with the three specific examples. And these all happened in San Diego County within the last two years. Four years ago, we had about 1,500 CCWs in San Diego County. We have 18,000 today. We're growing at 600 a month because of Bruin. Thank you, Supreme Court. That means that we're growing 7 to 8,000 CCWs a year in San Diego County. That means the odds are there's going to be an interaction between a CCW and some asshole at some point. It's just statistically likely. And so these three cases are my cases, just my cases. And they happened in the last two years. That's going to keep happening. There may be other CCW cases, but San Diego County gun owners generally hears about them all. So I think these are the three CCW cases that have occurred and been charged with felonies in San Diego County. All right, what's the first thing you want to do after you use force? Again, brandishing, ADW, discharge. The first thing is do not have your gun in your hand. That's not legal advice. That's self-preservation. Because you're going to stay there, and when the cops show up, you shouldn't have a gun in your hand. All right, so I've seen a couple of presentations like this, and people said, well, put the gun back in your car, put the gun down on the ground, and step away from it. I am not a fan of losing control of my, my firearm. And so as long as I have the ability to conceal it, I'm going to conceal it. Then the cop can take it off me later on, as I'm going to tell them to do. But I'm not having the gun on me. So don't have a gun in your hand. If you still feel like you're under threat, if you discharged and you shot somebody because you thought they were about to hurt you and they're with their friends, you're going to be comfortable putting your gun on the ground? Probably not. But if you hear and have the ability to process that there are lights and sirens, you've got to get that gun out of your hand. It's just an accident waiting to happen. All the cops are doing are reading their MDTs, mobile data terminal, the printout in their car on the computer. They're repeating what a 911 caller, not you, told them. You don't know what's on there. What's on there may be crazy guy in a blue shirt with a gun. You know, it's a bummer of a birthmark. You're the only one in a blue shirt at the scene. So get the gun out of your hand. Crucially important. Don't leave. The only caveat to don't leave is if you feel under threat, leave. But if you leave, you have to be on 911 at the same time you're leaving. And we're not saying drive home, drive to Arizona, drive to Vegas. We're saying drive around the corner till you're out of view. Because if you're out of view, you're not in, under threat anymore unless somebody's chasing you. And if somebody's chasing you, then keep driving and tell 911, someone's chasing me. I think they're trying to hurt me. But that's the 1%. The 99% is you don't go anywhere. You put your gun away, you sit on the curb if you feel comfortable to do that. Don't make statements to civilians. There'll be people around you. Don't talk to them about what just happened. Why? You're not sure what just happened. This is probably one of, for many of you, the most stressful event of their life, particularly if you discharged your firearm. 
you're not mentally right, and you're probably not physically right. And so don't think that you're going to be spouting out the truth. One of these cases involved the CCW who brandished ADW, and then he called 911 at the same time as the, quote, victim, and he couldn't get out what he meant. And what he kept saying is, sir, why did you, why did you draw your gun? He was touching my car. He didn't mean to say he was touching my car, but that's what wound up on the 911 call. What he meant to say was he was trying to get in my car and my wife was inside it. And so imagine how that got crammed down his throat later on. You drew a gun on somebody trying to touch your car, and that's exactly the question the 911 operator had. Don't think you're right because you're not. Don't talk to civilians. Caveat. Tell the civilians to call 911. Tell the civilians to ask for a paramedic. Tell the civilians to ask for the cops. Tell the civilians that there's a CCW holder on scene. Tell the, cop, the civilians to talk to 911. Don't alter the nature character of your gun or ammunition. If you just had the bad luck to plug in that 30 round magazine into your pistol that day and manage to conceal it, don't throw it away. This entire sequence of events that's about to happen to you is based upon your credibility. You have to say what you were feeling, you have to say what you were thinking, and you have to be believed. You're people that sit on juries. If someone starts out lying or cheating, you think that you're less or more inclined to believe them down the line. If your gun isn't on your card, you got a new gun, eh, you just couldn't get to the range to get the qual done, you haven't filled in the paperwork yet to get the sheriff to change your card. It's just not on there, but you were carrying it. Don't try to hide it or throw it away. You're going to eat that. Because whatever happened is worse than that. And we have to deal with that. There are people that, and a lot of firearms instructors disagree with me on the next one. The next one is lawyer advice. It's not firearms instructor advice. One of the best firearms instructors I know is Bill McLaren. He runs 2A Firearms. Uh, he runs uh, McLaren Defense. He's been an expert witness for me in one of these CCW cases. He was a trial expert witness. Knows what he's doing. We both came from Scotland, so we're tight. Uh, he emigrated later than me. I, kept my, I lost my accent after getting the head flushed in the toilet multiple times in sixth grade. He kept his. That's the difference. Bill McLaren says, get as far away from the person you just shot as possible. Why? Because he can guarantee that you've pissed them off because you shot them. You're not sure if they're dead. You don't know if they're armed beyond what you're seeing, the gun lying on the ground. Might be another gun, might be a knife. So get away from them. My advice is based on if you're the only one there, you better administer first aid. Let's go to this scenario. So the DA charges you, you go to trial, we're in trial, the coroner gets on the stand and the DA says, how was the victim injured? Well, he had a cut on his femoral artery. What would have saved him? Somebody rendering first aid would have saved him if they were able to plug that wound. He died of exsanguination. He didn't die because of the gunshot. Gunshot wound caused the breach of the artery and the artery bleeding out. But if someone had put a tourniquet on his leg, he would have, sure he would have survived. He'd be sitting here. You want that to be the scenario? So render first aid. Uh, if all of you don't have uh, a first aid kit in your car, assuming you're close to your car, but if you have a first aid kit in your car, it should have a battle dressing and a tourniquet in it. That way you have the ability to render first aid. If anybody else is there, you have them render first aid. Why? The person you shot probably isn't pissed off at them. So Bill came up with the happy middle ground. You know, your lawyer's telling you act like a human. I need you to act like a human. I need you to humanize yourself. And he's saying, I need you to act like a responsible gun owner and save yourself. The happy middle ground, according to Bill, is use the entire magazine and make sure they're dead, and then render first aid. You eliminate all the problems. You know, of course, you can only use that entire magazine if you believe that you're under threat of great bodily injury or death. But, you know, you can dump a mag in two seconds. Now, if, and keep most of them on target, depending on how close you are. Have someone else call 911. 
Same concept with don't talk to civilians. You're just not quite right, and you don't want to talk. But if you're the only one there, you have to call 911. What do we call somebody who shoots somebody, leaves the scene, and doesn't call 911? A defendant. That's what you call them. You're getting charged. You shot somebody and didn't tell anybody. And so if you're the only one there, your hands are kind of tied. And you know, your thought process has, has got to be, you have to think about this in advance, not while it's happening. What am I going to do in this situation? If I'm by myself and I shoot somebody, I'm going to render first aid. I've got to try to make myself safe. I've got to call 911. How do I balance not talking on 911? Hey, someone's been shot. I need a cop. I need an ambulance right now. I'm rendering first aid. Here's the location. Thank you. I'm done. Render first aid. Cops should be coming. Uh, I can guarantee you what's going to happen, though. What's going to happen after you hang up? They're calling you back. You know, answer. Hey, I'm, I'm doing CPR. I can't do this. I'm trying to plug this hole. I can't do this. Are the cops coming? When are they going to be here? Is the ambulance coming? This guy needs help. Call your attorney. You're going to have a period of time between your defensive use of force and the cops showing up, whether it's two minutes or three minutes if you're exceptionally lucky, or seven or eight or 10. And if you're rural, 45 or an hour. You know, if there's a shooting in Borrego Springs, it really depends where the one deputy that works in that town is. If they're somewhere west by Valley Center, they'll be there in an hour. Uh, you want to call your attorney and you're online with 911 uh, and they want to keep you on the line. I'm sorry, I got to do first aid. So Hang up. They call you back. What? Well, just. So, well, you'll get back to them. Just call them back. You guys called me. I was, you know, you got to talk to, you don't have to talk to your lawyer. Text your lawyer. You know, call your lawyer. We had a, 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 an attorney that I work with is in the audience. We had a case where somebody was involved in a shooting, fled the scene, jumped off the balcony like Jason Bourne. You know, he's a 32-year-old pharmacist with no record. After he shoots somebody in his house, jumps off the balcony, and then takes off while the cops are all showing up. And he is on the phone like seven, eight, ten times trying to get in touch with Chuck Michelle, who's a firearms lawyer in uh, Orange County. I mean, he's not really a criminal defense lawyer, he's a firearms rights lawyer. And so all those calls showed up. That's what do the cops do. They're dumping your phone. They're getting your cell phone records. So fit it in. How do you text? Do you text? Well, you have the ability to go in USCCA and designate a lawyer. Also, at the end of this presentation, if you want me, my phone will be up here. Just take a picture of it. You know, all you have to do to me is say 911, and I'll call you back on the phone. You know, if I get it. I mean, it, it, I sometimes get them. If it's 2 in the morning, it depends if the phone wakes me up. You know, but if, if you have to use defensive use of firearms, please do it during my business hours. It, 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 work, it works better for me. All right, but... Uh, I, I can tell you, I got a call uh, on a, a murder case uh, at 9 o'clock at night, the night before Thanksgiving. And it was a family calling saying, our son just showed up. He's all cut up. He said his friend was killed. He had to roll out a car. He was almost murdered. What, do, what should we do? I said, eh, you know, let me come over. So I went over to the house. And I'd just gotten into the house. And I met the kid and said, OK, tell me what happened. And the parents are standing there. And there was boom, 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 boom on the front door. San Diego police, homicide, opened the door. So they tracked him because he lost his shoe and he left his phone at the scene. His friend was dead in a car. And so I asked him, I could, open, I could answer the door. And parents said, sure, we, we've never done this before. So I went and answered the door, and it was cops I knew, homicide detectives that I knew. And it was, I'll never forget it, because they're all stacked up on the door, and I opened the door. You know, I opened the door. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, and the sergeant who I knew, Chris Lay, he's in the middle, and he goes, oh, man. And then one head comes out from the back, 
Ron Newquist, who's a detective, and he's looking at me, he goes, get the fuck out of here. Like, they didn't expect to see me there. It's like, you know, I'm like the Joker. We didn't get a load of me. Uh, and, but that happened, that ha and, and that kid wound up being a witness in the murder trial of his friend, not a defendant. And there was a fight about whether it was a mutual ripoff of a gun buy. And he could have been a defendant if he said the wrong things and the bad things happened. He wound up being a witness in that trial. Those two guys got life without parole. Two guys, and his friend was dead. And that's because I got there, for, I, I think because I got there first and, and contained what was happening. Talk with the first responders, nothing, some or all. I've changed my position on this totally. The cops haven't caught up yet with the fact that there's multiple CCWs in San Diego County. They haven't adjusted their procedures. I'll give you good news when we get into a case about the DA adjusting their procedures. But if the cops see you with a gun, they're starting out, you are behind. It doesn't matter you are a lawful gun owner with a lawful gun on you lawfully, you are behind. Because the cops are used to 1,500 CCWs never seeing lawful guns. If they see a gun, you're wrong. You're already getting charged with a misdemeanor. We can work from there. And so they haven't adapted. So no matter what people are saying or doing, and no matter the set of circumstances, every one of my clients was arrested, every single one. So what's the point? Why would you talk to the cops? It can't be used against you not talking to the cops at the scene. Absorb that you're going to jail. If you have a defensive use of your firearm, absorb you're going to jail, however shortly. And you're getting out, for the most part. It depends if you actually shoot somebody and if they actually die. But you're getting out and you're going to jail. Don't talk to the cops. How do we deal with that, though? You don't have to be a jerk about it. I'm just not in the right state of mind to give you an accurate summary of what happened. I need to think about it and think about what happened and process this. I'm freaked out. My heart's going. My brain's going. I really need to sit and think about it, and I want to talk to my lawyer. I'll give you a statement, but I need to, to calm down and talk to my lawyer. Well, if you don't want to talk to us, not right now. It wouldn't be helpful for either one of us. It wouldn't be helpful for you anyway. Assess your physical and mental health. That ties into not talking to 911, not talking to civilians. I'm being generous saying that the average age in this room is 40. We, come, we the older population, come with some inherent issues, physical and mental health issues. I would always like you to see you leave the scene of a shooting in an ambulance rather than a police car. And I can guarantee you, you will always leave in an ambulance if you say, I'm having difficulty with my breathing and I'm having difficulty with my heart. And, and you're not making it up because I guarantee you it's going to be happening. And if you're on medication and you're on blood pressure medication and you're on blood thinners and you're on some other type of medication given our age, then there is no reason for you to leave the scene of a stressful event in the back of a police car as opposed to an ambulance. It doesn't mean that you're not getting put in a police car four hours from now after you've been at the hospital. It just means you're not leaving that scene. And what have you also done? If you've contacted me, you've bought me enough time. I might meet you at the hospital. I'm not saying it'll work. I'm just saying that these are things that are productive for your future lawyer. Give statements or don't on the basis of your physical or mental health. And I, I need to change that to don't give statements on the basis of your physical or mental health. I've, I've, I was always work with law enforcement, don't work with law enforcement. I just don't think it's productive. Don't lie about anything ever. Back to credibility. Credibility is the thing that's central to your case. You could be unknowingly lying by giving a statement. He was trying to touch my car. And that's what he said. When I talked to the guy, he said, I have no idea why I said that. He was trying to get in my car, and my wife was in the passenger seat. But that's not what I said on 911. I don't know why. Don't text, don't call, don't write a letter, don't make a TikTok. Don't make videos. There'll be plenty of videos to be had. As soon as that first cop shows up on the scene, there'll be a video. Because his body warrant's going to capture. Except most of it will be, if you have your gun in your hand, two hands in front of his chest. And hopefully not you getting shot. Uh, the only person you should be talking to is your attorney. 
Uh, I got a caveat for that. If there's a family member in your immediate vicinity, have them deal with it. Have your family member contact me. So if there's somebody's there, have your family member call 911. If you give partial information, you may go to jail. If you say absolutely nothing, you are going to jail. Absorb that. If you don't talk, you're going to jail. Unless there's eight witnesses saying a crazy guy ran at him with a knife in the air saying, I'm going to fucking kill you, and there's cameras and videos, and the cops can clear it in that two, three hours. If they can clear it, absolutely, you're not going to jail. But if it's, eh, you're going to jail. Unless it's absolutely clear what happened up front. Uh, criminal charges are not your only problem. You know, there's uh, Bill McLaren says, every bullet comes with a lawyer. You know, some bullets come with multiple lawyers. You're getting sued. Uh, I would really encourage you, if you're a CCW and you have assets and you have a family, I would encourage you to, to establish a trust so that your trust can't be pierced and those assets won't be available to anybody that tries to get two, three, four, five million dollars off you. It's really important to shield your personal assets if you're a CCW. And getting sued is almost guaranteed. There are lawyers out there that will take any shooting case, no matter the facts. I mean, you see people getting shot by the cops who were attacking the cops that sued the cops. It's going to happen to you because they're looking for a quick payout that somebody pays. And in this case, who will pay? Uh, I do most of my work with USCCA. I also do uh, Right to Bear, Citizens Defense Network. Uh, I think there's Legal Shield. Whoever you choose, choose someone. And I'll tell you the USCCA experiences I've had with each one of these clients. And they've been very positive. I have a current USCCA case right now uh, that's worked the same way. All right, so what's brandishing? Because this is most likely to happen to you. Drawing or exhibiting a firearm, even unloaded. No mag, no bullet in the chamber, brandishing. Even if the person you brandish at doesn't see it. So if you brandish and someone's looking away, but a third party sees it, that's brandishing. Brandish in a rude, angry, or threatening manner, except in self-defense. So what's your salvation? Any time you show your firearm or display your firearm, you're apologizing from the beginning in a non-rude, non-threatening, non-angry, please stay away from me. I'm sorry I had to do this. Please don't make me do anything else. I don't want to have this gun out here. Can you please move away from me? How are they going to convict your brandishing? You are apologizing while you're brandishing. Rude anger, is that rude anger you're threatening? Is there a difference between back up or I'll fucking kill you? That sounds a little angry to me. Do you get charged with that? How about please step away from me. I don't want to do anything else. Get back. Please stop. I don't want to do this. That doesn't sound rude, angry, or threatening to me. So that's your kind of way out of brandishing. Is, and and if, you can, if you exist in that moment, then you're probably a lawyer who's done a lot of this. Or you're a really good shot and have thought about it before. So you don't want to get to the point of pointing. But if you think about those things now, what am I going to do if I ever brandish? Just do it in conjunction. The point of brandishing is to get people away from you. Please get away from me. I'm backing up. Stay away from me. Don't come near me. That's the point of brandishing. Say that. Not, I'm going to kill you if you take another step towards me. Unless someone's got a deadly weapon in their hand, and then all bets are off. And what I'm telling you is not meant to obviate your safety. Your safety is number one. You shouldn't be thinking about your lawyer on number one. If you see somebody, if I see somebody moving towards me with a knife, and they're saying, I'm going to kill you, and they come within 20, 25 feet of me, I'm going to shoot them. I'm not thinking about what happens later. All I'm thinking is, if I don't get my gun out and on target, this person's going to be on me in a second and a half. And that's about the fastest in a good day I'm ever getting my gun out. And so don't let this obviate your safety. And you need time. You need time both for your own personal safety and your mental thought process. Buy yourself time. Find a way to back up. Speaking of backing up, and I always skip this, how many of you know, 
How many of you are aware that California is a stand your ground case? Raise your hand. 20% of the audience. California is a stand your ground case, not through legislation, through the self-defense jury instruction. In the self-defense jury instruction, it says, and the jurors are told, there is no duty to retreat, comma. In fact, if pursuing would reduce the threat, you are allowed to pursue. That means you can chase somebody down. If you think that there's a gun over there, and they're there, and they look at you and say, I'm going to get that gun to kill you, that seems to fit. Here's the problem. Jurors have to interpret these instructions. They might not think it was prudent to pursue somebody when if you went the other way, nobody would be dead. So you can survive, don't retreat. You don't have to retreat. You don't have to retreat in your house. You know, we got castle doctrine too. Castle doctrine actually is in the penal code in 198.5 for the penal code. So California is both a standard ground and a castle doctrine case. Why? Because the legislature haven't fucked up self-defense instructions yet. California is a miserable state for firearms regulation, one of the worst in the country. California is one of the best countries in the state for the firearms self-defense jury instruction. How did that happen? Because the legislature hasn't been able to get involved yet. The cases that established the duty not to retreat came from 1890. And those 1890 cases have made their way into this jury instruction and nobody's fixed it yet. No duty to retreat in California. First case, a uh, man in his 50s who has a pocket knife on him. Didn't have his CCW, he, for, he didn't have his carry weapon, he forgot it, but he had a CCW. It was in his house. He went walking around Mission Valley with his wife. They lived there in one of the big condo complexes down by Mission Valley Mall and Fashion Valley in that area, really nice condo complexes. He walks back to his condo complex and in the common courtyard, which is uh, very well developed and nice and large, there's a homeless person setting up for the night. Cart, tarp, getting set up. He goes in, confronts the homeless person with his wife by his side, and says, you've got to get out of here. This is a private area. You, you can go sleep on the street all you want, but you can't sleep in our courtyard. And the homeless person starts confronting him, pushing the cart and reaching into the cart. The man takes out his pocket knife. And here's where things went bad. He takes out his pocket knife and is immediately disarmed by the homeless person, who then stabs him three times in the arm. Guess who went to jail? The guy that took out the pocket knife. The CCW, who, according to the cops, injected a deadly weapon into a fistfight. And what was the homeless person doing? Not retreating and acting in self-defense. So the cops arrested that guy. He got arrested for ADW, and his wife called me from the scene. So they called, U they called USCCA. USCCA called me, gave me her number. I got her just as he was getting wrapped up in the car and driving. I, uh, and uh, here's the thing. Eyewitnesses tip the balance, all, always. There was an 18-year-old security guard who said, yeah, I don't think the guy should have pulled the knife. And that tipped the balance into his felony arrest for felony assault with a deadly weapon. And that's what he was arrested for. Uh, by the time he got to the jail, my bondsman was already at the jail. So he got bonded out within like four hours. Uh, USCCA, he had to pay the bondsman $3,000. I think it was a $50,000 bond. Bondsman only charged 6%. Sometimes bondsmen do you favors. So he charged $3,000 on the $50,000 bond. He got a check from USCCA within 10 days for his bond. USCCA covered the event. USCCA paid me directly. But I'm on the case while this guy's being arrested. Before the cops written his police report, I, I'm working. Uh, next day, I was down at the scene. I, I figured it out, talked to people what was happening, saw that the homeless person was known in the area and known to be aggressive and violent, and then I managed to contact the district attorney before they issued the case. What happens is the cops write the reports, they send them electronically to the district attorney's office, district attorney issuing department decides what charges fit the police report, they write a, a complaint, and then you get to go to court if you haven't bailed out two, three days later. What's the worst day in San Diego to get arrested for a crime? Wednesday night, the day before Thanksgiving. 
Why? No court Thursday, no court Friday, no court Saturday, no court Sunday. Monday is day one. Tuesday is day two. You're in court Tuesday, perhaps in the afternoon, and you got arrested Wednesday afternoon. Six days before you get to go to court if you don't bail out. Never commit a crime the Wednesday. Have a happy Thanksgiving with your family. Never commit a crime the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. So what happened with this case? I managed to convince the DA not to file. So the DA didn't file the case because of the information I provided. It was just a weak case. And it's always better to be involved in a funny crime than a non-funny crime. People are human. People issuing your cases are human. You know, and it's like, okay, so if he'd only stabbed my client two times, would it have been a misdemeanor? You know, was the three times the line for you on the felony? You know, and if you get somebody laughing, sometimes they just, it takes the air out of the situation. And so no charge. That's the first CCW uh, that I handled. That was the oldest one about two years ago. And he wound up walking away, got a CCW back. They stripped the CCW at the scene, walked away with that. He got it back in 10 days. So he's back to even. Go ahead. Well, uh, Castle Doctrine doesn't work outside of your house. Okay, so even in your... It's, it's the contained walls of your house, including the attached garage. Okay. Right? But, you know, the, uh, we had that case that we were talking about the guy jumping off the balcony, shooting somebody in his house. I, I've got the video, and usually when I expand upon these and I have more time, I'll show you the videos that we made. We made a three-dimensional video in that case because the entire fight was, where was the dead guy when the shots happened? That was the entire case, because the dead guy was two feet outside the door on his back with his feet up in the air, and both shell casings were outside the front door. So where was the dead guy? And we had to show that the dead guy was in the doorway, Castle Doctrine, and the reason the shells went outside was the gun was in the doorway and was ejecting just past the door frame. He beat murder, but he got convicted of uh, voluntary manslaughter. Uh, Self-defense is two parts. You actually believe someone is trying to kill you or inflict great bodily injury, and your response to that belief is judged reasonable by another group of people. So you have a subjective portion and an objective portion. You subjectively believe you need to defend yourself. Objectively, what you did in response to that was reasonable. So they found that, yeah, you really believe this guy was this unarmed guy coming in your door was going to kill you and kick your ass, but your response to shooting him in the throat and the chest was unreasonable. So we'll give you not full self-defense where you walk away. We give you partial self-defense where you're not guilty of murder. Now you're getting sentenced on voluntary manslaughter. And in California, anything with a gun is bad news. Ratchets up the time. So this 32-year-old pharmacist wound up with 16 years. You know, for shooting somebody who was unarmed, in his doorway. It's always really bad news, too. You know, and, it, and there is a sexism component wrapped into the law. If you're a big dude, the only people you're getting to shoot are armed people. Jurors are going to say, you're going to have to take the hit first. You're going to have to take a thumping before we allow you to shoot an unarmed person. Well, now we're changing. Yeah, we're, we're changing it. The, the example I say is an 85-year-old guy who's just finished his chemo treatment, and now three unarmed people are saying, we're going to kick your ass and take your wallet. You know, I don't think a jury's going to feel bad if that person's a CCW and takes out, I don't know how they'd feel about all three. Because generally, when you shoot one person, unarmed people usually turn around and head the other direction. If they're coming at you after you shoot their friend, yeah, they were threats to begin with. And so it's, it's situational, yes, Let, but, but that's not situational. Someone's, you're, you're 300 pounds, big dude, 6'4", and someone's coming at you with a knife, Sam, and going to kill you. Nobody's going to fault you for shooting them, as long as you didn't provoke the incident at that point. How about we make it an unarmed person? It's a 95-pound woman and a 300-pound guy's coming at her saying, I'm going to rape you. No one's going to fault that woman for shooting an unarmed man, because you, you're going to be disarmed immediately. And so every use of force is situational to the facts and the force. And so where does that fit? 
yeah, it kind of fits closer to justified use of force against unarmed people than non-justified use of force. And then one of the things the jurors told us was, you know, he might have been able to shoot that guy, but he had to take the hit first. He had to at least get punched or be in a fight. He had to, and what you're doing, what they were saying is wrong because now you're letting somebody into your space to take your weapon from you and shoot you. But that's how they felt, and they're the ones that get to judge it. All right, number two. Uh, I really like this case because I really like the dude. He was a 20-year-old guy, disabled veteran. Uh, he had joined the military. So when someone joins the military in 2012, out of high school, and they sign up to be an infantryman, what did you think they were signing on for? In 2012, signing as an infantryman. Afghanistan and Iraq, guaranteed, back to back, over and over again. No possibility of anything different. He didn't make it because at night on a fast rope out of a helicopter, he dropped 20 feet and hit the roof and then rolled off the roof of a second story building and hit the ground. He ruined his shoulder, he ruined his left knee, he became 70% disabled, gets checks from the VA for 70% disability. He was an armed security guard, he was going to community college, he was moving, transitioning into SDSU, he wanted to be a criminal justice major, he wanted to go into politics, he wanted to go into uh, deal, giving back to the community. I mean, and that's who the guy was, so I really like this guy. Uh, he was armed with his CCW firearm that was on his permit, and he's driving back with his wife in his car from, from Chula Vista looking at houses. They were looking to buy their first house. They had no children, but they're both in their 20s. His, his uh, wife was a biology teacher for uh, middle school. They pull into a gas station in Spring Valley, and I still have the picture because the gas was 335. Uh, and it's nostalgic to me, so I kept the picture of just the pictures of the gas station. And uh, it was cheap, so there was a lot of people waiting at the gas station in Spring Valley. So he pulls up to the pump, and somebody coming from this direction said, no, that's my pump. And then within 30 seconds, the person who said it was my pump was screaming obscenity to his, to his wife in the passenger seat while he was standing out with the gas pump out, jammed in between that little area between the pump and the concrete with the raised concrete coming up to the back of his thigh, his, his calf, and he was jammed in. And then that person drove his car right at his car and screeched to a, a stop right in front of his car, jumped out and started running around the front of his car where his door was open. So he's thinking, I'm 70% disabled, I got a bad knee, I got a bad shoulder, I'm jammed in with this pump. If I go backwards, I'm going to hit my head on this raised concrete pillar. I may die. This guy's moving towards me, and he's moving towards the open door. I think he's trying to get into my car where my keys are and my wife is. So he turns. This is all on video. Unfortunately, he had a Jeep. So all you see is two hats. You don't see anything else. You see the two hats on the back of the Jeep because of the camera angle. But one thing you did see was a big deal. He said he drew and brandished. And then the guy reared back and he turned and pointed. When he reared back. And they were apart by about five feet. And what did you see on the video? And I rolled this back and forth on the video. His hand came up. And then like a, Hannah, you know, like a Looney Tunes cartoon, as soon as that gun came out and was drawn, the hand stopped in midair. And then went back down. All right, so that guy got arrested because there was a third party said, I don't think he should have pulled that gun. That was just a fist fight. So he got arrested for felony assault with a deadly weapon and felony uh, brandishing because of the eyewitness. The eyewitness who, if you, as we find out later, starts yelling, I'm tired of all these Trumpers and their guns. That kind of detracted from his credibility as being an impartial arbiter of what happened during the armed confrontation. His CCW is snatched immediately, and he loses it. The D I thought this case was going to resolve. Maybe he's a misdemeanor. Maybe he's a diversion where he doesn't even plead guilty to anything. It's just like a misunderstanding. Because he's CCW. is lawful. and shouldn't even be charged. No. The DA is so pissed off because I kicked their witness's ass at prelim, they charged a non-reducible felony. In California, there's a felony called assault with a semi-automatic weapon from old days, when it used to be mostly revolvers, and then semi-automatic became the bad gun, before AR-15s became the bad gun. So now, there's still this statute on the books, assault with a semi-automatic firearm. 
three years, six years, or nine years in prison. Can't be reduced to a misdemeanor. If you go to trial and lose, a judge can give you probation, but you're going to have that felony on your record for the rest of your natural life, unless you get a certificate of rehabilitation and a pardon from the governor. So you're a convicted felon for the rest of your natural life. This is a 27-year-old disabled vet with no record. An intact family, like a good dude. This never should have happened. So what did we wind up doing? We get right up to the day of trial, and they say, we tell you what, we'll go back to the old charge, assault with a deadly weapon that's reducible to a misdemeanor. He pleads guilty to the felony, and a year from now, if he stays out of trouble, we'll reduce it to a misdemeanor. Now, thank you for being so magnanimous for a guy that shouldn't be charged to begin with. Uh, he, I said, what do you want to do? He goes, no, I, that's not right. I'm not a felon, so I can't plead guilty to a felony. And we went to trial. We went to trial on that, and he got acquitted in three hours uh, of all the charges. And the thing that I liked, and it was alcohol jury, I always need an alcohol jury, especially for guns. Uh, six of the jurors waited 20 minutes and hugged him as he came out. You know, because they felt the same way. This never should have happened. All right, so what did this result in? I told Michael Schwartz this, uh, San Diego County gun owners president, and he was incensed that we had to even go to trial on this. And so we got a meeting with the DA, Summer Stephan, and, Summer Ste and we explained to Summer Stephan the thing we talked about a little while ago that said, you know, the cops aren't treating these right, and your branches, your branch offices, DAs aren't treating these right. Just because you have a gun doesn't mean you're wrong. And she, and she came back a month later, to her credit, and said, I agree with you. From now on, CCW cases are going to be heard only through my special operations branch who handle police shootings because they understand uh, use of force issues better than my young deputies and branches do. So we managed to change San Diego County policy because of this, but he still ate this. you know. And here's the thing. He wasn't a USCCA member. He tried to join USCCA two days after he got arrested. Most insurance companies won't sell you fire insurance two days after your house burns down. It's a bad business model for them. And so it, it cost him a good bit of money. And it wouldn't have, because USCCA would have paid every dime. He had to pay his bail, and he had to pay my fee. Uh, and there's not much the guy could do. There was no injury to either side. But, and he got his CCW back. So first case, no charges filed. Second case, uh, acquittal at trial. Third case, 30-year-old guy armed with a CCW, the gun's on his card, Carlsbad Road Rage. So I got to tell you what they're saying and what he's saying. What he's saying was, I pissed somebody off doing something, and they were behind me at a, a light. They follow, I saw that they were following me, and I drove through a red arrow. And they followed me through the red arrow, and then they pulled up next to me at the next light. Windows open. They're yelling at me. I can't understand. I rolled my window down. A bottle comes out, smashes on my car. And by the way, he went to a detail the next day after he got out of jail, and there was marks on his car, liquid and glass. So we had all those pictures. He did that himself. And then... I drive away, I brandished, and I thought they shot at me when the bottle hit my car. I thought it was a gunshot. So I pulled my gun out of the side of the seat where I had it. I didn't point. I just said, get away from me. I'm armed. My light came on. He's got a light laser on it. And now we're off to the races. He takes off, and they start chasing him to the point that the night they call 911 and say, that guy pointed a gun at us. But they're on 911. And what are they yelling? We got guns in Montana, too. That didn't help them. The dispatcher saying, sir, can you please stop chasing the armed man? And the, the guy saying, that's a little bit of attitude, to the dispatcher. So their witnesses sucked. But the cops arrested that dude. The Carlsbad police took him in on the, the word of these two scumbags. So he got arrested. He went to jail. He managed to clear things up. The DA charged him. Felony assault with a deadly weapon, felony brandishing. I got into the case. I managed to cut up that 911 call that showed they were idiots. The DA calls them up. They were idiots to the DA. And the DA said, and it's unusual, the DA just dismissed the case flat out before preliminary hearing. So he walked away. Done. Gone. What they also did is something that they're doing here is GVRO, gun violence restraining order. The cops are misusing the red flag laws, gun violence restraining order laws. They're arresting him for a felony, 
and they already filed a gun violence restraining order on him at the same time. Before he got out of jail, he got a restraining order, a civil case. Never mind the felony case. So the felony case goes away. We still got to deal with the gun violence restraining order. I managed to convince the Carlsbad city attorney that their witnesses sucked, like the DA was convinced. And she dismissed the, the what's called an EPO, emergency protective order. Basically, we have no right to participate. You're getting it. There's no court hearing. Cops send a, a report to the judge, and the judge signs it, and now you've got an EPO on you. Well, we defeated that. So we beat the case. We beat the GVRO. We go to get his CCW back, and what do they tell us? Sorry, this stinking turd called SB2, which strips people of the ability to carry a gun anywhere, just came out on January 1st. A lot of pieces of SB2 have been held, but one of the pieces that wasn't held was, if you've ever had a GVRO against you, you can't get a CCW for five years after it's terminated. So we're actually filing on that Monday or Tuesday of next week in San Diego Superior Court suing the Sheriff's Department and the DOJ saying this is a total violation of due process. We had no right to participate in the EPO. As soon as we were allowed to participate, the EPO was dismissed. How can this be constitutional? You can strip somebody of a right, and they have no right to participate in it being stripped. And so we think we're going to win that. We got a meeting with, we actually got a meeting with uh, the undersheriff on it. Who knows how it goes? Uh, but that hasn't been filed in San Diego County before. This is the first ones that are being filed. Another lawyer and myself are filing them for people that are in this position. Beat their, their restraining orders. Beat them in court, but now still can't get a CCW for five years because this law says you can't and the law's never been tested or challenged. They just wrote a law, and they don't care. They don't care it's unconstitutional. They don't care it doesn't work. They don't care it's unfair. They write the law and say, your ball, and force people to adapt to it. Say again what the EPO is. Gun violence restraining order, okay. red flag. Typically, when you get uh, an EPO, emergency protective order, it's a code word for GVRO. It's the thing that precedes a GVRO. Then the EPO goes to court, and either the EPO goes away or the EPO becomes a gun violence restraining order, one of the two. And the gun violence restraining order can last up to five years. And we're seeing a lot more of these because the cops are not using them for the, the reason they were intended. They weren't intended to piggyback off felony arrests. They were intended for people that were going crazy. And the family said, hey, this guy's going crazy. Maybe he shouldn't have guns. Or coworkers saying, you know, or this is a potential school shooter. You might want to take a look at it. That's what they were intended for, not this. But now we've got this problem. <laughs> we're dealing with it. We beat the criminal case. We beat the EPO. And now his CCO screwed up. All right, that's my uh, name and number. You can take a picture or you can go on the UC USCCA website. And uh, I'll be on there. You can elect me as your attorney if you want. There are plenty of other good lawyers on there you can elect. Uh, or you can uh, go on the State Bar website and my name and my number. And by the way, that number, that number is my cell phone. I have a very small practice. It's not some receptionist or answering service. It's me. I have direct communication with my clients and personal communication. And I try to keep it that low because I don't take that many cases. Oh, because here, my wife uh, says I'm lazy. For and questions so here. And then I'm going to... Hold this. Gary, my, uh, my, my question is, it, is your specialty use of force law? Well, I was a public defender for 25 years. I've been a private lawyer for the last eight years. I've handled, uh, I've tried 20 homicides myself. I've handled 50 or 60 homicide cases. I've participated in the gaming or case and strategy and theory of about 400 homicides in San Diego County. So I'm very familiar with use of force, firearms and uh, use of force laws. So gun laws, use of force, all the way up to from brandishing to murder. That's a strong yes. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? If not, thank you for your, go ahead. What's your hourly rate? What's your hourly rate? How do I rate? What's your hourly, hourly rate? rate? Hourly rate. I'd have to see your financials first in order to, <laughs> in order to figure out what my, what my hour, but what really my contract hourly rate, my contract hourly rate is $700 an hour. Okay. Uh, I do cases for fixed fees because that can get away from people. And I usually substantially reduce my fees for members of San Diego County gun owners because I made Michael Schwartz that promise that if I represented San Diego County gun owners, I'd reduce my fees. Uh, 
I didn't charge that disabled veteran as much as I would charge other people. Why? I wanted to do his case. I needed him to, I, I needed that to be successful. And I'm a good lawyer. And so, you know, there's, there's not many people do this stuff. You know, I don't know many people that are representing CCWs in the county. We'd know. You know, we're, the reason that we're there next week first is because we're first. We're, we're at the tip of the spear on this stuff. Wait, question here, and then we'll go up there. Yeah, I was just wondering, once you get arrested, um, what's the experience, um, you know, going through the process of, of getting arrested and then going to jail and getting printed? And like that, that's a, probably a pretty traumatic you know, experience being handcuffed. Yeah, and certainly for people that have never been arrested before. So how are you getting arrested? You're getting arrested at the scene. You're getting put in the back of a police car. If this is a homicide and you have agreed to talk, you're going to be brought down to the police department and you're going to talk to homicide detectives in a room at the police department. If you have invoked your rights not to talk, I, want to, I don't really want to talk to you. I want to talk to my lawyer. If you've invoked your rights, you're going right to jail. And if it happens in the city of San Diego, you're going to downtown jail central. If it happens in North County, you're going to Vista. If you're a woman, you're going to Las Colinas out in Santee. That's where the jails are. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Yes. Oh, yeah. Well, you're going to the downtown jail and you're, you're going through booking. I can't stop you from going through booking. Once you arrive at the jail, you're getting booked, fingerprinted, pictured, searched. They'll search you. You may get to put your clothes back on in the holding tank, especially if they know you're about to be bonded. But the jail's determining if you're bond eligible. If you're charged with a murder, you're not bond eligible. I got to get you to court to get you out of jail. You're going to get no bail on a murder. You're going to get bail for everything that doesn't involve uh, somebody being injured. Even if somebody's injured, you might get bail. A murder? It's going to take me two to three days to get you bail. You're going to be in jail for two to three days if somebody's dead and you're charged with murder. Uh, that answer your question? Okay. Yeah, uh, just a general question about plea deals and when they're offered or accepting them, consequences. That Generally, plea deals are offered within the first 10 days of you being charged. So you show up, you go to jail. If you don't get out of jail, you'll be in court. As long as it's not Thanksgiving, you'll be in court within three days, generally. Uh, if you get hit on a Monday, arrested on a Monday, you'll be in court on Wednesday. And that's your arraignment. And then seven days after that arraignment will be your first chance to settle the case. And then you'll have a preliminary hearing two days after that. So when do they make plea offers? They make plea offers within 10 days, generally, of two weeks of you being arrested, if you're still in jail. That's your first try. But if it's a serious case, you know, what, what's the offer going to be? What's the punishment for first-degree murder in California with a gun? Anybody know? 50 to life. 25 for the murder, 25 for the gun. 50 to life. What's the punishment for second-degree murder in California? 40 to life. 15 for the murder, 25 for the gun. So how much negotiating room is there that will allow you to live a full and productive life? Up front, none. Some point later in the case, uh, my, my friend who just left, uh, we resolved a case up in Vista where somebody stabbed a 20-year gang member in the chest with a butcher knife because he was fighting his brother on my guy's lawn. He was charged with murder with a knife, 26 to life, 25 for the murder, one for the knife. Always better to kill somebody with a knife in California. Always better. One versus 25. All right, so 26 to life, what did he get? We got him involuntary manslaughter, three years. He's going to be out next month. No parole, no probation. That case was from a year and a half ago. Piggybacking off of that, do most of your cases um, end in plea deals? Or, or do uh, most of the cases the in general? Statistics in, in San Diego deals? County are 3% of the cases go to trial. 3% of felonies go to trial. Every 100 felonies charged, only three wind up in trial. That's the statistics in the county. We try to front load our cases and work the cases so that We've maximized the ability for you or anybody else to get the best resolution early. So we charge a little bit more up front because we're working the case sort of back to front. But if it's going to trial, we're going to trial. Uh, I'd say we wind up in trial. I'd say we're at about 20%. 25% of our cases wind up going to trial instead of the 3% for the county. Because, you know, we go to trial. Our last three trials have been acquittals. 
You know, we've walked people away in our last three trials. You know, which we, we know when we should go to trial. But again, this is the hardest part of criminal defense. It's your risk. You know, we go home. I go home and have, you know, I usually break out the 15-year scotch after, the, after trials. I go home and have a scotch and sit on my balcony and relax. You've risked your life hoping that I do a good job for you. And I understand the magnitude of the choice that you've made, but the consequences fall on you. You know, I, and I have to stress that to you. It's, you know, what's that line from Clint, Clint Easter, Dirty Harry? Do you feel lucky? You know, I, I left off the word punk. You know, it's a, okay, thank you for your time. Oh, sorry, go ahead. One, one more question. Um, so I'm a single, and I have five big dogs. I don't have a gun. But if somebody comes into my home unwanted, right, and I have my gun, I, I'm, I'm liable, I can hurt them, right? Should if, so, if someone's in your home, <clears throat> Castle Doctrine has built into it a section that says someone unknown to you, and I call that the drunk brother-in-law exception. You can't shoot your drunk brother-in-law because he broke into your house. It has to be somebody you don't know who forcibly entered your house. Then the presumption of the castle doctrine kicks in, and the presumption is they are there to inflict great bodily injury or death on you. If someone's in your house, you don't have to wait and see if they're armed. You know, I guess if, if you come out with your gun and they drop to their knees and say, please don't shoot me, and you kill them, that's probably outside the castle doctrine. You know, it's, but yes, if someone breaks into your house, you don't have to assess the situation at that point. Someone's in, the key is identification. Who is the person that broke into my house? You know, and that's why I recommend, I recommend everybody have a light on their gun that they have in their home. Mm -hmm. Because your choice is flipping on the light and exposing yourself to make that identification. Or using the light on your gun, light laser on your gun to make the identification. Whatever you want that solves the identification problem. Yeah, you know, I, people do that. I like both hands on. I, that's how I shoot. I don't, you know, if I'm, I'm not usually practicing one handed. I'm practicing two handed. They can get to You can still come after them. Yeah. Once you shot him inside. My dog attacks him. But we just have to prove you shot him inside. 